Donald Trump still benefits from a lower standard in the mainstream media, right? He's still, he's still treated better pound for pound than any Democrat. And the reason is because he has so many scandals, lies, and offenses that he's just completely broken the scale. There's not enough space. There's not enough superlatives to capture the epic nature of his corruption in evil and racism, etc. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. It's Friday. It's the weekend. Well, actually, it's Thursday for me. We're taping this Thursday afternoon because I am officiating my little brother's wedding this weekend. So if there, any big news happens on Friday morning, uh, that's why we didn't get to it. So I'm here today. I'm delighted to be here today with Jonathan Chait of New York Magazine, uh, who I love to read, who I find to be almost always right. And yet, some, for some reason, you're deeply loathed. On the internet, sometimes people people get very mad about Jonathan Chait, the center left progressive Democrat. What do you? I want to start there, Jonathan. Well, Why can you give us some self analysis? What is it about you that draws so much ire on the internet? It's hard to answer that without being flattering to myself. But um, <laughs> please be flattering to yourself. <laughs> look, I think there's uh, an assumption that you're supposed to um, be a team player in this business. And I think increasingly people are held to the standards in journalism that are applied to political activists, yeah. which is that you're there to, to help your team. When I started in journalism in as a, as a liberal, there was an incredibly strong incentive to be counterintuitive, to, uh, to show that you were a tough, independent minded liberal by, by punching at your own team and to show you weren't just a hack. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, felt pressure to do that when I didn't want to do it. And I resisted that pressure. Um, and I feel like that incentive is completely flipped around in, in progressive journalism to the point where you really stand out more if you're a liberal who is willing to disagree with other people on the progressive side. So that I think, um, you know, is, has kind of, so when I think you're talking about hate, you're talking about people on the left who hate me. I mean, I've always yeah. had people on the right who've hated me. That's been consistent, yeah. but it's been a real increase in people on the left. Yeah, you have a pretty broad brush of people that dislike you, I notice. Uh, we share the anti-anti-Trump folks. You know, it's always, yes. it's the narcissism of small differences. The anti-anti-Trump folks really hate us and then and then really kind of us. hate you. And then, like, don't really – they don't they have to pretend to hate, like, Bernie and stuff at this point. They don't even really hate them anymore. And yeah. then the far yeah. leftists really hate you. And like oh, wow. sometimes they get mad at us, but not not really as much. So you know, yeah. it's kind of the, it's the family feud thing. Okay, I, well, you flattered yourself. I want to. We have a lot of policy we want to get into, but before we do policy, yeah. you flatter. I want to flatter myself a little bit because the last three mm -hmm. podcast guests we've had, none of whom were old enough to remember the OJ car chase. So I'm starting to like feel okay. like I need a walker, and so I'm hoping that you can make me yeah. feel younger by telling me what you remember from the late OJ Simpson, maybe his football career or something. Football career? You think I remember, remember his football, football career? career? Do you remember his I football do not career? remember his football career. <laughs> I was born in I was born in nineteen seventy two. I don't know. When was his football career? I don't know. I think he retired in like nineteen eighty or something. Okay, you were eight. I thought maybe you might remember his no, retirement. No, I don't remember his football career. I, I remember his. I remember the car chase interrupted the, the NBA finals in nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Um. So I was old enough to remember that. And where did you and fall he, on the murder? Because that was something that was. I did not that was an commit the murder. Left. I have. I I was not in that part of the country. I have an alibi. Mm. But, but you're, 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 lot, you're thinking the likelihood that OJ committed the murder, pretty high for Oh, you. OJ, yeah. No, I definitely thought that OJ committed the murder. I mean, yeah. OJ, you know, so... Were you writing for TNR at the time? To, to, no, the I was in college. You were in college. Uh, well, the, I, so I graduated, so I, I, I actually was out of in, in the professional workforce when the trial happened. But yeah, no, it was, it was sim I mean, similar to Trump in some ways, right? I mean, Trump is kind of OJ for white people. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have in the sense I'm not saying that there's a equivalent legitimacy of the sure. grievances. I mean, I feel like black people had extremely legitimate grievances yeah. with the LAPD. Yes. Which caused all and, also and cops similarly, in OJ was a very weird vessel for their grievances. Like Trump is a weird vessel for a rural totally life's wrong, grievances. Right. A yeah. totally wrong grievances. Right. So you had with African Americans, you had like completely legitimate fair grievances about 
police abuse and not trusting the police for valid reasons. And so then you have a guy who's come along being charged with murder, and then he tragically kind of becomes a hero to elements of the of that community. So you have this huge racial split where just like, you know, large numbers of black people think he's innocent yeah. or support him in some way, even if they at some level know he's not innocent. And it yeah. was really mystifying, I think, for a lot of white people as to why this was. I mean, I think it took us a while to kind of understand the depths and the pervasiveness of police abuse as the cause of that of that response. Yeah, I do. The, I agree but, with that. There was definitely some legitimate grievances. I will say, if you think that our racial and our kind of political dividing lines are, are intense now, I'm going to put in the show notes. I just watched yeah. the Oprah. Do you remember this? Oprah, Oprah's audience watched live the OJ result. It was a bad yeah. call for Oprah. Let's just say when you look when you look at the response in the crowd, yeah. and it, it makes me yeah. uncomfortable just talking about it. But if you're if you're curious, people can watch that in the show notes. All right, let's get serious. Yeah, policy stuff. Uh, Joe Biden. Um, uh, yesterday, the Department of Justice is going to finalize the rule um, that was part of the 2022 um, bipartisan gun deal that yeah. President Biden signed. Um, yeah. One of the elements of that was closing the gun show loophole. Yeah. I, I think this is so important to bring up because. The first time this was really, and it had been discussed in many circles forever, but like where it became a hot button politically, it was introduced in Congress, was after Columbine in 1996. We're in late, yeah. we're doing a late 90s theme here with OJ and Columbine to start yeah. in 1996. So here we are a quarter century later, and it finally gets done. Um, I, I, anyway, I think there's a lot that can be learned from it for, from that. And it also says a lot about Joe Biden that he doesn't ever get credit for these kinds of things. Just kind of wondering your reaction to the, to the gun show loophole and that gun deal. And then just generally what it says about the Biden presidency. Yeah. I mean, I would say compared to what I expected after Democrats had Senate control, so full control of government, albeit narrow full control of government in early 21. Yeah. Um, Biden has produced less in the way of liberal legislation than I hoped and expected in terms of changes to the welfare state. Really? Uh, yeah. Changes okay, to the welfare state. Let's go through those. State. What did you hope and expect more of? Uh, I really thought they could get a permanent expansion of the child tax credit. Sure. Um, JVL writes maybe. about this yesterday in the triad. This is yeah, like, I would I, even, I, I barely that call that liberal. That was like a reformicon conservative thing. I mean, both sides wanted it, but like that was a big, that was a Marco Rubio platform provision in 2014. Right. And so it is kind of crazy. Yeah. That that didn't get yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't really buy that conservatives. I mean, that's, that's redistributive and conservatives yeah. hate redistribution. Fair. So I thought in terms of major redistributive changes to the well, to the, to the welfare state, um, that was to me like a minimal expectation that they didn't get in turn, you know, maybe like a, a child child care program or some kind of social safety next expansion for, for paid children. leave they, kind of thing. Yeah, they didn't. Right. Well, right. Um, paid, paid, paid leave. Right. That sort of thing. I, they didn't, they didn't succeed in getting that. And that to me was a disappointment where he's exceeded my expectations was in his ability to get bipartisan legislation. Now those things don't, exist at the same scale as the kind of liberal welfare state changes. But I was pretty cynical when Biden said, I would get this town working again. I'll work with Republicans. We'll get some things done. We'll get, you know, we'll get some small things that we agree on. I thought, no way. Um, but he did it. And I think the gun show loophole is, is, is a good example of, of a really solid expectations beating record in that, in that department. Yeah. And it's meaningful. I, I have a lot of, I've heard a lot from people in the gun um, gun safety movement, in part because my status as a former Republican, for whom this is an issue that I'm I'm passionate about, uh, that is you know in line with progressive folks, and I do think people under it's it, given the scale of the problem of of yeah. gun deaths in this country, right? It, it right. seems like kind of small ball. It can seem small ball, yeah. but like yeah. uh, when you just think about the the mass shooting problem, right, as opposed to the the you know, handgun much crime, larger right? problem of endemic shootings. Here. Exactly. The man, right. like just limiting the ways in which those radicalized, mm -hmm. oftentimes young people can get guns is very important. Right. And this was like right. one of the easy ways for, for them to do it. So, uh, so it was good and meaningful. And sense. radicalized old people. Yeah. I mean, they're and, and radicalize old, people old people's access to guns. You mean, or, or yeah, the gun you know, shows I mean, themselves radicalize the old people? Maybe a little. No, bit no, no. I mean, they're they're radical, yeah. radicalized old people who have access to guns that who shouldn't have access to guns. Uh, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I agree with you on that. On um, 
I think that the ex the Biden expectations beating though, don't you feel like he gets so little? I I feel like he gets so very good. little credit for the expectations beating on the bipartisan side of things. I think in part because yeah. maybe some of the left don't want to don't want to acknowledge that, that that there are a handful of normal Republicans left. I, I don't know. I feel very comfortable saying that the Republican Party is totally radicalized, and yet yeah. Joe Biden still managed to make a couple deals with them. Like I, I don't think that those two things are in conflict. But I think sometimes people right. do feel like they are, and so they don't want to say it. Yeah, I mean, I think the mechanism by which a lot of these deals get made is just to take them out of the news. So, you know, there's this phrase that's used, secret Congress. And yeah. Some of it is secret Congress, right? We're like literally Congress will just emerge like we we hammered out this deal. No one knows about it. And here's the bill and we're voting on it today. Um, some of these deals aren't secret Congress. The, bi the bipartisan infrastructure legislature wasn't secret Congress, but it wasn't heavily covered. Yeah. And and that's why it passed, right? Because if it becomes a big part of the news, then it becomes enmeshed in political conflict. So if you really do it on the down low, you that's how you get some of these deals done. So the flip side is that's how you get them done, but at the cost of getting a lot of news coverage. It just kind of comes and goes right. without getting a lot of attention. It's the conflict. It's the stories with, with that pit the parties against each other that really lodge in people's memories. Or if it comes and goes and, you know, you have it done and then Donald Trump decides that, you know, the Republicans aren't allowed to do it, as we've seen a couple of times. Recently. That's true. That's true. That no, Trump can actually sort of raise the salience of some of these issues. Um, as somebody that's a pro-choice coming from the left, I've, I, you wrote about Carrie Lake's embarrassing abortion flip. Um, yeah. Uh, we've been kind of discussing a lot from our sort of perspective. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think listeners are like, why wow, you guys are like, I, I'm always encouraging the Biden campaign and the Democrats to kind of embrace the Biden Biden's kind of reluctance on this issue, actually. To, and and they, they shouldn't embrace his reluctance. They should campaign on it aggressively, but that the, yeah. but that the rhetoric should be aimed more towards a broad <clears throat> audience. Um, some some you know yeah. um, pro-choice folks don't love that. I'm I'm curious what your take is on. I mean the the Carrie Lake thing is just so embarrassing, and how Democrats yeah. should best be able to 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 leverage it. Let me start with your first point because I've yeah. written about that as well. the The pro-choice groups, like a lot of progressive groups, have a mission to push public debate as far left as they can. So as part of their mission, they have. Um, lobby Democrats with enormous success to stop talking about abortion the way Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton for a while talked about it, yeah. right? Safe, legal, and rare. Right. Um, we respect the rights of religious people to disagree, but the state yeah. shouldn't be intervening. Instead, they want people to talk about abortion in the most positive, unambiguous possible terms. Um, so it's a kind of Overton window play of, of pushing the public debate, but that comes at a cost of those politicians being able to build the broadest possible coalition. Right. So if you're Joe Biden, um, yes, you could talk about abortion like your audience is pro-choice activists, but that comes at the expense of your ability to actually win those marginal undecided voters. And, and, and he's instead talking about it the way he always has, you know, as, as a kind of Catholic who's conflicted about abortion. I don't love yeah. abortion, but I don't want the state making these decisions for us. And he's taken incredible amounts of flack from the pro-choice groups for doing that. Yeah. And and he, here's where they really have a choice between do you want Joe Biden to win or do you want to just focus maniacally on this long term plan to change the, the contours of the abortion debate? I, I mean, I understand why they're doing it. I would like to change the contours of the abortion debate, but I really want to win the election. That's yeah. that should be the number one goal, and that should be their number one goal too. And I think they should get off his back. Yeah, and Biden's got. I, I have to say, the Biden ad, um, the first one they yeah. put out two this week on abortion, but the first one yeah. featuring the woman in Texas. I just I, this one I thought it was so mentioned. powerful because I'm looking yeah. at it. I'm like, this appeals to to people in my life, like me, who are pro life, yeah. like who are actually pro life at, at some whatever. I, I kind of hate calling myself pro life at this point because now it's like to say you're pro life. It's kind of like the word conservative. It like means that you're on board with the zero week eighteen sixty four law, which like I never yeah. was at any time. But right. but that but that want to value an unborn child's life, right? And his his ad this week was was featuring this woman that like wanted to have a baby, had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. was unable to get the procedure because of the draconian Texas laws, which are disgusting. And, and those laws are going to maybe prevent her from having another baby. 
Yeah. And so that is like the whole, you know, so that yeah. that it brings in the maximum number of people, right? So pro-choice people are rightly outraged about that woman's situation. But yep. pro, but even people who are like, who are fully pro-life could look at this ad and, and be like, this situation is terrible. This woman wanted to have a baby and she needed a life-saving medical procedure and she wasn't able to. Like, we need to fix that. Yeah. You're, I mean, I hope you're just going to continue to see these ads everywhere between now and November because it's unbelievably powerful. I mean, I you know, it almost takes your breath away to, 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 to listen to these horrible stories of, of, of what's happening to women and is going to continue to happen to women around the country. And, and Republicans, I think, are just in denial about the fact that their policies produce these outcomes inevitably. And they have no way to stop those policies, those awful tragedies from ha happening over and over. And they have no way to talk about it, as mentioned right. by Carrie Lake this week. In her right. Carrie Lake, you're right. So in case you missed it, Carrie Lake um, earlier, two years ago in 2022, was saying the abortion law she had was is the 1864 one. She cited it by name. It was AR313- yes. She cited been, been incredibly refer specific reference to the statute. And then this week she said, oh, I, that wasn't the law I meant. I meant something else. So like instead of, but she like cited the case number. It was did you see? I need to. I, I need to put this also in the show notes. I'm trying to. Yeah. I, I have to, I'm pulling it up. I gotta get this guy's name. Did you see the the name of the the person? The story of the person who actually authored the 1864 territorial abortion law, no. William Claude Jones. It's really amazing. We'll put it in the show notes. William Claude oh. Jones abandoned his first wife and three children in Missouri. His second wife was a 12 year old Mexican girl who he abducted. And then he and then when that was revealed, he wife. had to resign in, in his quotes, job. Yeah. Then he moved again, had a third wife, 15 year old girl. Um, obviously, women couldn't vote at the time. Uh, his Wikipedia page, uh, William Claude years. Jones, was a, a American politician, fabulous and, quote, pursuer of nubile females. Oh, oh. Wow. so that's that's Carrie's man. That's Carrie's man in Amsterdam right there. Um that's uh, unbelievable. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's really good. Um, okay, so we've got um, – uh, you had an article recently um, that caught my attention. You have many. You have a few that caught my attention. I'm just going to pop through them all here. Um, the first one was about Schumer. Um, this was a couple weeks ago now, but yeah. um, but it was when Chuck Schumer uh, essentially – you know, said called for Israel and said that Israel, it's time for them to move on, move on from the Netanyahu government. Yeah. Um, this is why this is why I like read John Chase. I'm always like, I don't know what John Chase's position is going to be on that. I could I could have seen you coming down on either side of that yeah. um, uh, controversy because it was an intra left controversy. Some on yeah. you know Jared Moskowitz was on this podcast that he didn't like that Schumer right. said that you were were on on the side of saying that that yeah, if Israel wants what's what's best for its people, it should be listening to Chuck Schumer. Yeah. So talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, Schumer is basically trying to let the Israeli public know that the American alliance isn't going to last forever if they want to follow Bibi Netanyahu's one state course. That um, it's gone on for a while, but I think that essentially they should have the information that if Israel wants to be a one state ruling over the Palestinians without any serious effort at a two-state solution. In the long run, it's going to be isolated. And to the extent it has an alliance with the United States, it's going to be an alliance with the Republican Party that's, you know, that's intermittent and depends on Republican control of government. Uh, the Democratic Party can't last with that kind of Israeli policy. Um, and a lot of uh, Israel supporters, not all of them Republicans, objected by saying, how dare you tell the Israeli people how to vote? Because what he did was he said, you need to get Netanyahu out of there. You need to get new elections. Um, and he said, you know, you're interfering with their elections. But I think he's doing a favor for the Israelis because I'm not sure that all the Israeli people understand how precarious a situation Netanyahu has placed them in vis-a-vis -vis the United States that Netanyahu really has placed them on a course for a solely Republican-focused alliance with the United States and, 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 their, and Israel's ability to have a bipartisan support from, from the United States is fracturing and, and can't last much longer than Netanyahu. They deserve that information. I think Netanyahu has been lying to them about that. He's been convincing them forever that he can manage the American alliance just fine, and that's not really true. What would you say to critics from, you know, kind of the pro-Israel left, Zionist left that would say, okay, but I, like the threats, a lot of the threats from the left to Israel are, are based in anti-Semitism, that they are not credible, that they are, 
you know, cruel. Um, and that by Schumer, Schumer saying that he's basically throwing in with those with those critics and kind of undermining, you know, the the credibility of people on the left in the West in America that that want to work constructively with Israel. He's only throwing in with those critics if your conceit is that there are only two positions on the issue. And if you think there are only two positions on the issue, then yes, you have to pick one side or the other. Yeah. But um, if there are only two positions on the issue, then we're dead. Um, the whole idea of liberal Zionism is is completely distinct from the you know left wing radical critic critique of Israel that's that's in vogue now um, among young left wing activists and the one state fetish on the right that completely disregards the needs and, and humanity of Palestinian people. Yeah. I have one. I think there's one other weakness potentially with the argument uh, that you're making from the from the other side, which is that Netanyahu is assuming that he will have support from the one state uh, for the one state solution on the right. Because I, I mean, I, I think that the support for Israel right now is weakening on the activist right, uh, and you know, I think that yeah. you see that with Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson, yeah, yeah, that was fascinating. I mean, it feels like I've been spending my whole career waiting for the far right. <laughs> to to look at his pro Israel policy and say, wait a second, those are those are Jewish people that we're supporting. Um, why are we doing that? We don't we don't support Jewish people in other contexts. Um, and I mean, I'd be glad it hasn't happened yet. But um, I feel like um, anti Israel um, slash anti Semitism is the natural resting home of Tucker Carlson style populism. Yeah, and I and I think that the um, well the the Republican. Uh, the Republican class that want that is that feels more um, pro-Israel, that are more in line with what Likud is doing, I, I think a lot of times has blinders on to the potential threats from from their own side on this. And one example of that is Donald Trump. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump does not. If you actually listen to Donald Trump talk, he doesn't sound as strong in Israel as the Donald Trump apologist types like present him as when they talk about Donald Trump's right. policy. And there's one. Right. And so I want to, you, you wrote about this exchange with you, Hewitt. Oh, let's listen to a little okay. bit of it. And I'm not sure that I'm loving the way they're doing it because you got to have victory. You have to have a victory and it's taking a, a long time. And the other thing is I hate, they put out tapes all the time. Every night they're releasing tapes of a building falling down. They shouldn't be releasing tapes like that. They're doing, that's why they're losing the PR war. They, Israel is absolutely losing the PR war. That's how I, I read your interview. That. I read Steve your interview as saying they're losing the PR war. They've got to stop releasing bad video and win the they're war releasing, by going into Rafa. They're releasing the most heinous, most horrible tapes of buildings falling down. All right. So two places we can go with that. The first one is yep. one you wrote about, which is that he does seem to have a lot more empathy for the buildings than for the right. humans. Right. He's he's a sociopath who's unable to feel any kind of compassion for human suffering. Yeah. So most of us see people starving and dying and we feel bad for those people, but he can't feel that. But he does see the buildings coming down. And I feel like as a developer that really just <laughs> gnaws at him, the waste of the waste of capital, someone's investment has totally <laughs> collapsed. Waste um, of a well a well constructed building gone to <laughs> gone to waste. Right. I mean, think of the rents that could have been collected. Um, it just it's it's awful. The landlords. Um, but you know, also that's that's Hugh Hewitt trying to feed him a line. Like you're still yeah. an arch conservative Zionist. You're still an arch conservative Zionist, and he's just kind of wriggling away. And I think it's because he understands that the left is tearing itself up over Israel, and he just wants to stand to the side and let that happen because he's definitely collecting votes um, or if not votes, um, the, the absence of votes for Joe Biden from people who are to Biden's left on Israel. And that's a part of his constituency, especially in Michigan. And he does, you know, he doesn't want to raise the salience of his own thinking on the Middle East and wants it entirely focused on Biden. Well, and the anti-Semites in his constituency, which he's obviously very, which Donald Trump is much hmm. more aware of than I think yeah. the um, kind of Republican donor class is, right? And let's let's not overlook the fact that one of the anti-Semites who's going to be voting for Donald Trump is Donald Trump. 
Right. To, like consistently says things about Jewish people that if they were said by a member of the squad would, you know, have um, Mitch McConnell marching in the streets demanding their resignation. Right. Like, you know, you people know about money and, you know, you, you people uh, follow your leader, Bibi Netanyahu. It's just like the grossest stereotypical stuff. Right. I mean, he's always been around Jews, but like he, re you know, he respects Jews as you know, as people who count his money and, and he, you know, he thinks Jews are smart and can be his lawyers, but you know, he is in some ways like a real 20th century anti-Semite too. Yeah. And this is the thing, this is a very frustrating thing for me. So you wrote about the Republican billionaires who are no longer upset about the insurrection or coming back on board to Trump. You mentioned yeah. Alan Levine. We've talked about a couple of times in this podcast, Nikki Haley donor that I had the exchange with on MSNBC and in the green room. Right. Um, and uh, where he has now come back around. He had said he was not whatever Trump had now come back around. But you're you're hearing this a lot. I've seen now Dan Senor uh, say this on social media. I've seen Jonah Goldberg say it on social media, all, both uh, people that I, I respect, I think have fair critiques of, of Joe Biden's policies at times. But th they're all saying that, like, that there is frustration in this, whatever you want to call it, neocon class. It's not all Jewish people. It's 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 also pro military, kind of traditional mm -hmm. national security yeah. conservatives. So people in this in that class are are mad at Joe Biden for the ways in which he's distanced himself from from Israel's offensive in this war. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though I, I, Joe Biden was stalwart with Bibi for many months longer than I, I mean, I expected him to be. And there've been other very pro Israel people like Richard Haas or the pro Israel centrist yeah. you know, folks who have said, you know, that the suffering is just too great. Like something has to happen here. And, and we're finally seeing some alleviation of that a little bit uh, with, with aid finally getting into Israel. But I, my, the question I have is with these guys, is it, it does seem like they just have total blinders on to what Donald Trump actually thinks and says about this. Like this notion that, that, that John, Donald Trump is certain to be a more, more reliable partner, I, it seems like preposterous to me. I, I, just, I don't understand what it's based in. Well, it's certainly based in the fact that he has no um, humanitarian sympathy for the Palestinians, okay. right? Yeah, like sure. Joe, that, Joe Biden is definitely mixed, is aligned with them on that. Yeah, that's true. Right, like Joe Biden's, you know, torn between his support for Israel as a Jewish state and his desire for Palestinian people not to suffer. Now, how you come down balancing those things is really difficult. So he's he's torn. He's cross pressured. Um, Donald Trump isn't cross pressured that way in the sense that like Donald Trump doesn't care what happens to the Palestinians. Um, but it's also true that he's not, um, he's, he's not committed to Israel's security also in any, in any kind of principled way the, as Joe Biden is right. He's totally transactional. He's totally immoral that, you know, like if you told him you, he could gain, you know, like a million dollars for like, Israel to disappear forever, but a million dollars would be in his pocket. He would take the million dollars, right? He doesn't, he doesn't care about Israel. He doesn't care about anything. And, you know, he's also in some ways, you know, financially in, in hock to uh, the Gulf kingdoms, which are willing to deal with Israel in a lot of ways, but also aren't exactly Israel's best friends in the world. I just want to just want to clarify because I don't want to misrepresent what Dan Senor and, and Jonah Goldberg had said. They're, they were making the case that it was not they weren't speaking to themselves, but that a lot of folks in their world, in their orbit, yeah. were saying that they were starting to become Trump, you know, lean back towards Trump and become more Trump sympathetic because they were so upset about Biden's handling of, of Israel. And I just you I, know what I, I've I, seen I find more often, actually. Yeah, go ahead. I've seen more often it's less of a criticism of Biden than they seem to be reacting to the left. Yeah, the campus left. Yeah, right. I mean, Levine's essay is all focused on the campus left, which is amazing. Like 75 percent of his message of why I'm voting for Trump is citing people who hate Joe Biden. Who hate him. People who who hate him, who are who literally call him genocide Joe Biden. <laughs> they call, they call him genocide Joe. They are they're literally attempting to stop him from campaigning. Like to, the only reason that Joe Biden is able to campaign at all is that he has security that's able to stop those people from disrupting him. Like they would not let him utter a word in public if they could. Yeah. They despise him, and they're and they're citing those people as if they're advising Joe Biden in the Middle East. This it's is the thing that crazy. makes me pull my hair out more than anything. I just don't care. I'm just like, what? I, uh, you're going to vote? Look, I, there are plenty of ways to rationalize voting for Donald Trump, and we can go through all of them individually and knock them all down. But yeah. I, just the most galling to me is that I will not. I will vote for. I will not vote for Joe Biden because there are campus leftists who, who literally would be happy if he died, like who want him dead, like that hate Joe Biden. Who want him dead? Many of them want. 
Donald Trump to be president. <laughs> like, the, I hate the campus left, so I'm going to join liberal. with them, <laughs> and I've joined with them to get the exact same election yeah. outcome that they are trying to engineer. Yeah, if you just watch these TikToks or watch these videos that go viral of of far leftists, like they're basically saying, I, I hate the neoliberals and I hate yes. the liberal left so much that I want to see them punished. And no, and who do they hate? Donald Trump. And so Donald Trump winning will make them so sad that I will go along with that, and that will be their yep. punishment for being complicit in this genocide. So it's yep. so like they're so so these rich. You know, folks that uh, that like live in in you know the pockets of prosperity throughout this country are going to donate to Donald Trump, like because they're so mad at people who who share their dislike for Joe Biden just for different reasons. Right. It makes no sense, and they're not mad, and 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 for some reason Donald Trump is not at all held to count for. Tucker or Nick Fuentes or people that he dines with, the people that go to his rallies. I mean, there are people that right. go to his rallies that are anti-Semitic, that hate Jews, that don't give an F about Israel, and they're wearing right. the red hat, and they're at the rallies cheering, but yet Donald Trump isn't held accountable for them, but Joe Biden is held accountable for the kids on UCLA's campus that are protesting. Right. One of the important lasting changes Trump has made to American politics, and I've written about this a number of times is that he's activated white nationalists as part of the Republican party coalition. Like right. before Trump came along, those people were totally locked out. They had no place on the right. They, they, they just partisan politics didn't interest them. Right. As far as they were concerned, it was a uniparty. Both the parties were terrible. They had no investment in partisan politics. Yes. Um, Donald Trump finally was speaking enough of their language for them to say, we care about this guy. Now he wasn't, giving them everything they wanted. He wasn't speaking entirely in their terms, but he was giving them something. He was giving them an investment in the two-party system. And they are now in the door. They're part of the coalition. They're on the team. And that I don't, that's going to last after Trump. I mean, Ron DeSantis has been afraid to alienate Nazis yeah. during, during his campaign. Like He understood that he could only go so far in terms of alienating those people because they're part of the coalition. Yeah. And this is and it's not like, oh, there weren't racists or whatever who who weren't, you know, there wasn't dog whistle messaging. Like all that right. stuff happened. But like sure. being actually part of the party infrastructure and feeling like you're part of the team and getting yeah. engaged and, and organizing within the party apparatus. Like it is right. different. I mean, like this is happening. We had Isaac Arnsdorf on on Thursday's pod. And it's like you see this at the local level. In my uh, Miami Dade, I, people that are going to the meetings now are part of the three percenters, are part of these racist groups. And you'd, I yep. would see it in social media. It happened overnight, where I was very active in right wing social media, you know, for years. And then all of a sudden, Trump comes down the escalator, el, el, escalator in twenty sixteen yep. and seventeen. You see pe these people that are like white genocide. You know, 420 is starting messaging you and, and the Pepe account. I, I, so so he he galvanized and activated that group to make them feel like they have power and they still do. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking as someone who admired the Republican Party before. Obviously, I was uh, an extremely harsh critic of the Republican Party. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have to recognize degrees of bad. Um, and, and the, and the difference, I mean, they have a, a totally different way of thinking about racism and anti-Semitism th now than they did, than they did then. Um, for sure. Okay. I have a, I have a media round table I want to do with you. Great. We, Great. Um, I usually don't, I don't love like broad, the media criticism, but I do like talking yeah. about specific media figures Individual people. and yep. yeah, and their motivations. Um, yep. and so I want to, uh, I have a couple of articles that you've written, but I want to start with an article that was in the free press, which is Barry Weiss's outlet. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, it was written by a longtime NPR reporter. Uh, yep. it was titled, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. Um, one of the lines that I pulled out of this race and identity became paramount in nearly every aspect of the workplace. Journalists were required to ask everyone we interviewed their race, gender, and ethnicity, and had to enter it into a centralized tracking system. Yep. The growing DI staff offered regular meetings, imploring us to start talking about race. Monthly dialogues were offered for women of color, men of color. Now, um, I, I was in, I, the, I was interested in the piece. I, that, that was part I pulled out because I, I think that that is like put it pretty blatant for anybody that listens to NPR, just like the degree of change to which every every story they have has to have kind of some identity lens on it, which I think is concerning. Yeah. There were some other things in yeah, the article I that I thought were like the other guy, he had he criticized NPR for taking the Russia threat a little too seriously. So there were some parts of the article that made me think the guy had been a little bit red-pilled. 
And yep. I, I didn't agree with all of his criticisms of NPR, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, I I mean, he led by by saying that like Mueller found no collusion. Right. Um, which was just wrong. That just right. so I just went through. It's like, do we have any editors? <laughs> Right. Any I editors mean, what here? a what a terrible example to, to hook your argument on. I I do think, you know, he has a broader point, and I do think his his critique about um, social liberalism is true of a lot of media. I mean, media bias is a really complex subject, and I feel like we could just get sucked into an endless discussion with endless caveats. You know, yes, but yes, but. Yeah, sure. um, I think on, on the whole, I would say. Um, Siloed identity politics coverage is very, very left wing in the in the mainstream media. So, like all these um, organs have not all of them, but most of them have dedicated beats, um, you know, race, gender, things like that, and and those beats tend to basically just regurgitate talking points and themes from progressive activists and treat them as authority figures and not apply any skepticism um, to their claims at all. Um, Traditional political journalism, I think, still works pretty much the way it has for the past, you know, uh, however many decades. It's still the same kind of structure in the Times and the Post and even in, in the NPR story about some some bill in Washington. You're going to yeah. introduce the topic. You'll say, here's what the Republicans say. Here's what the Democrats say. Um, you'll, you'll try to be objective. And I don't think it's changed a whole lot. Um, so I think uh, conservatives tend to, you know, lump it all in one big brush and treat the media as if it's as biased as Fox News. And it's not as biased as Fox News. There is some bias there. And I don't think they're very careful about distinguishing where the bias exists and where it doesn't. Yeah. I uh, I agree with that. And I don't, we don't, I don't even want to quibble with the political side of this. You could go around all day on the political criticism. I, I think the criticism of a place like NPR, that, that the part of the article that rang true to me, is that at times it feels almost alienating. We're like, I, I'm pro identity politics. I got to tell you, I, I I I got woke. You know, I have a black daughter. I definitely did the thing where it's like, oh man, I can't find a black ballerina at the toy store, mm-hmm. and like all that sort. You know, all the sorts yep. of little things that sure. I, I might have thought in the past would, were, yeah. were kind of minor complaints. Like started to hit home, and I was like, oh man, I, I really overlooked some of this. And obviously, there are much more serious examples of that. And so I'm for lifting up diverse voices, being conscious of that. I'm trying really hard about to do that on this podcast, but um, I, you know, the NPR thing at, t- at times there's, there's balance in all things, you know, and it's like, there's the old thing where it's like, there's an oil spill. And rather than talking about like the impact on the oil spill to the whole yeah. community, it's like, we're going to talk about the, the non-binary ident- indigenous, you know, and the, like, everything has to be through, a specific identity lens. Yeah. And and I think a lot of times the left criticism of this that resonates with me is that sometimes it's like, no, no, actually the problem is poor people as economic as, as the poor people sure. are getting screwed. The problem isn't like one specific identity that's getting, you know? And so I don't know, I think that's a fair mm-hmm. criticism of NPR. And it seems yeah. like this guy tried to speak to that and was almost kind of brushed aside. Yeah, no, there's certainly the rise of, of the idea of that as a, as a totalizing frame that can explain everything that's happening right. in the world. Um, and it's a really, you know, a reductive way of looking at the world where you're not just opening yourself up to critique and say, Hey, maybe we've been looking at this from the perspective of white people and we need to expand our vision and see how some of these stories look from other perspectives and see what we've been missing, For but sure. using race and identity to, um, as, as, as totalizing lenses to explain everything that's happening and, and, and just to, you know, have a kind of moral binary, um, uh, approach. So, so I think that's, I think that's a fair critique of NPR and, and other media outlets that have, that have used too much of that kind of way of looking at the world in their coverage. But um, I think especially in these siloed identity beats, that's where it's really most pronounced. Yeah. So the article was in the Free Press, um, which was uh, an outlet you did a profile on a while ago, Barry's yeah. outlet, um, which, as usual, I completely agreed with. Um, your, uh, well, I'll let you explain. How, how did you assess? I, her, her, her outlet is having extreme success. It has, it has It's at the top of the charts on Substack. Um, I think that, you know, we're number three. We're doing pretty good here at the Bulwark, but she's... Uh, you know, has a lot of readers. It's had a lot of success. Um, 
I, I, there's one big complaint I have about it, which I think is the one that you have. But what, how did you assess it after spending some time with the free press? Yeah, it was a mix, it was a mixed assessment. I think they do some good work, and I think there needs to be conservative journalism. That's real journalism. Um, it's right. not just um, conservative takes. movement. Right, right. It takes in just like conservative movement um, activism just communicating through quasi-journalistic. Yeah, disguised news. as a newspaper. You know, disguised as a newspaper. Physician research shop. And I wrote about this a lot in why we did it. Like my, the, the, what, what exactly was the difference between America Rising, the opposition research firm that I started, and some and like the Washington Examiner? Like yeah. not much, actually. They right. got the credibility for being a news outlet and we were a political outlet was basically the only difference. Right. No, you need like, you know, a place for people who are journalists and think like yeah. journalists and have conservative views because they can find stories that a lot of people on the left aren't going to find because of their disposition. I think that's a that's a valuable service that we need. Um, I think they have slid over into Trump apologism, though. Um, you know, I think their their coverage of of, of the Republican Party in, in Trump is is just is more hackish. It's more partisan than it ought to be. And I think that's, they're not finding stories that the liberal media is missing. They're just um, kind of regurgitating the same kind of Fox news tropes in those areas. So I feel like it's, it's really, it's really uneven. Yeah. I mean, to me, my main beef with the free pass ties into uh, Taibi, who we're going to get to next. And I think that mm -hmm. basically anybody, center left, center right, contrarian, centrism, anybody that is in the space that's not like clearly a partisan on one side or the other. And it's, and, and it's a question of, do you look at the world and you see the biggest threat being the progressive activists, the defund the police, Black Lives Matter movement, use of Latinx, world word police, trans movement. Like, yeah. do you see that bucket, whatever you want to call that, is the biggest threat facing the country? Or do you see the looming authoritarian possibility and the looming th slide into authoritarianism as, as fronted by Donald Trump is the biggest threat facing the country? And, and if you think the first group is the threat facing the country, which is pretty clearly what the free press thinks, like, yeah. I think if you're in group B, which is where we are, like a lot of those things, those complaints start to look pretty silly, like even if you agree with them. And like that is, I think, my main frustration with them is sometimes you go to their homepage and it's like, you know, we have an 1864 abortion law in Arizona. We have a racist lunatic that is tied in the polls and, and wants to turn the country into something ranging from Berlusconi to Mussolini as Italy. And like, that seems to be an urgent national matter. And that doesn't even appear on the page, but, yeah. but we're going to spend many, many articles like quibbling about what has happening on college campuses. Like that starts, that starts to look like it's just a totally wrong judgment to those of us who, who view the second group as the bigger threat. Yeah. I, so, right. I mean, we're in agreement on which is the bigger threat. Yeah. Um, as you noted at the, at the outset of this, I do criticize the left from time to time, probably 20%, maybe 25% of my arguments are directed against the left, you know, 75, 80% against the right. Um, I do think it's important to criticize the left. And the reason is that the the right has go, went crazy because the mainstream conservatives didn't stop the far right from taking over their party. And once they became alarmed at it, it was too late. They had too much power. Right. Um, you, you actually have to have those arguments and you have to have those arguments before it's too late, before they take over. Um, you know, it's like I, I get complaints from people on my side, you know, saying like, why are you complaining about the weeds in our garden when the other side, the other lawn of the guys across the street is nothing but weeds? Right. Um, it's because I don't want our yeah. lawn to look like their lawn. There's like a chupacabra got... walking through, like wading through the leaves, <laughs> like gra grab out trying to like make the make the metaphor even worse. Right. Uh, you know, there's some there's a alligator hiding in the weeds, ready to jump out and eat people. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, I mean, weeds. Weeds may not be the strong, the strongest yeah. metaphor I could I could use, but um, you've got to have those arguments before it's too late. Um, and you know, I wrote a piece in New York Magazine about the rise of the illiberal left in 2015, and the most common response I got, other than "Oh, you're a white man and you're just angry about your own privilege," um, was "Oh, who cares? It's just a bunch of." 
bunch of left wing college kids. They have no power. Um, but now pretty much those same people are saying Biden has to listen to these left wing college kids or he's going to lose the election. He has to he has to, you know. So we've gone from they're too small and powerless to be reckoned with to they're too big and powerful to be argued against overnight. There was not even like an hour in between when they were not neither too big nor too small and we were allowed to argue with them. Yeah. Right. So so these are really disingenuous arguments people can make about ignoring problems on your on your own side. And the reason they make those arguments is they want to just smooth over the whole coalition and keep peace on their side. And that's fundamentally what Taibbi is doing. He's not when he says the Republican Party has no institutional power. He can't possibly believe that, right? I mean, he understands they control the Supreme Court. They've controlled the Supreme so, Court for 50 I don't think so, actually. Again, I just I want to get to Taibbi. So, for, okay. so like, yeah. just come back because it is, they're coming from different places because Taibbi comes from the sure. left and Bari, uh, you know, is more, I guess, from the center, right? Whatever you want to call, call it, the free press. But, like, I, I, I think it might be genuine that they both look at the, they think Donald Trump is a clown and that yeah. they live in liberal environs. Uh, you know, Mari lives in L.A. Taibbi, I think, lives in New Jersey. You know, right. they're wealthy. They're successful. Everyone around them is a liberal. Uh, right. Like Donald Trump is preposterous to them. Yep. They survived yep. the first four years of Donald Trump. They're not a poor woman in Alabama that needs a abortion. They're not an immigrant coming across the border that that is trying to flee free terror. And they, in their worlds, like there really isn't that great of a threat. I, I I don't I don't want to sound like oh you have white privilege thing but it's like and they they do they live in like a cloistered bubble where the things that bother them and that threaten them are from the left um, and some of them are legitimate some of them are absurd complaints but yeah. they look at Trump and they I think that they think that oh the Republicans that, that that isn't they don't have any real power like the big corporations don't even like them anymore yeah you don't I think mean, that's Tybee, you don't Tybee's think that's genuine actual line. Taibbi's actual line that he wrote was the Republicans have very little institutional power nationally. Now I I understand. Like how do you right, write that I mean, sentence? How do you write that sentence? I mean, I understand they what he's the saying. Controlled House of Representatives and the Supreme Court. <laughs> right, like he's smart enough to understand that the federal government has power, right? That the judiciary has power, the House of Representatives branches of of government like the United States government has power. That's not a new idea for Matt Taibbi. Um, so what about the uh, statement? I think that both Taibbi and Barry would say, which is, okay, all right. I might've, I might've overstated it by saying the Republicans don't really have power and Donald Trump is sure. kind of a clown. I do believe that. But what I'm really, what I'm really talking about is that there's all these journalists out there, NBC, ABC, AP, you know, mm -hmm. CNN, and they're all focused on mean, bad orange man. And so, and there needs yeah. to be a counterbalance to that. And so we're just going to ignore bad orange man and we're going to focus on, you know, bad liberal prosecutor DA. Sure. I mean, I think that would be a good argument if conservative media didn't exist. And I feel like a lot of conservatives live in this mental world in which conservative media doesn't exist because they talk about the media like they're only talking about the non-conservative media. But conservative media is enormous. Fox News is by far the biggest television network, by far. So, um, you know, when when Ty, that was Tybee's other argument is that, well, no one's out there holding the Democrats and the left accountable, like other than the biggest network in in the country. Right. Um, so, so again, that also just absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. It, it really is wishing or imagining the, the entire conservative apparatus from its media to its, to its political arms, totally out of existence. It's, and it's, also it's who bad. took down Andrew Cope Cuomo and Bob Menendez. And I think that's the other thing, like, sure. Yes. Right. I, I, I will stipulate that on balance, the, the mainstream media, was is focused a lot more on Trump corruption uh, for good reason, by the way. I don't know. I, I'm always like, I, I think it's very hard to be the New York Times because, like, if if one of the major parties is run by somebody that that lies every day and is a yeah. criminal and is a bigot, right. then that that in some ways is like the only news every day, right? It's sort of right. like, what am I supposed to do? Not talk about this? Um, and, but so I, I do think it presents a problem. But I, I, it's not as if the uh, you know, it's like Dr. Carlson didn't create a right wing New York Times, despite the fact that he said he was going to. Right. It's not right. the the Fox that's breaking these things. Every once in a while, Fox will break a story, but not really. Fox has fired most of their actual reporters. It's the liberal like most of the bad things, you know, about Democrats were were uncovered by the were the covered by the mainstream media. 
Absolutely. And, and Donald Trump still benefits from a lower standard in the mainstream media, right? He's still, he's still treated better pound for pound than any Democrat. And the reason is because he has so many scandals, lies, and offenses that he's just completely broken the scale, right? It's like, you know, as you've discussed many times, right? It's just impossible to hold him to normal standards because he's so far outside the realm of normal that it's just that there's not enough space. There's not enough superlatives to capture the epic nature of his corruption in evil and racism, et cetera, et cetera. And then meanwhile, and so, there's so, also no comparison between the way Fox handles him and how the mainstream media handles Democrats, right? It's right. like, like the Absolutely. Mike Pence comes out against Fox. It isn't even mentioned. I, I I saw I did not monitor Fox all day yesterday, so I'm basing this on someone else's report. But assuming the report is accurate, Fox said abortion like three times yesterday on the day of the eight, right. the Arizona 1864 law. They just ignore bad news in a way that that like you know AB uh, you know Lester Holt would never. I, you know, if Kamala Harris right. came out tomorrow and was like, I can't support Joe Biden, you know, because <laughs> like, it's not like ABC would be like, we're not going to talk about this one today, guys. We got to we got to keep our right. team on side. You know, it's preposterous. <laughs> right. Right. Let's 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 talk about um, systemic racism somewhere. Let's interview an English professor at Oberlin. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to end with a little dessert. Our favorite topic, our mutual favorite topic, Rich Lowry, the National Review. Um, you started a series at New York Magazine. I don't know if I've mentioned this. People should be signed up for your newsletter at New York Magazine, by the way. It is awesome. Um, uh, he, uh, you started a series, The Insurrationalizers. Um, I came up with a lot with the word myself. What do you think? Insurrationalizers. It looks better on paper. That's the first time I've said it out <laughs> loud. It's a little harder to say than I thought, actually, <laughs> it was going to be. But I got it, so it works. Okay. Um, a right. series about All conservative right. critics of Donald Trump who justify voting for him anyway. The prototypical figure you had in mind was Rich Lowry. And you guys yeah. got into a back and forth about something that flummoxes me a lot about these guys, which is that they, you know, will say, oh, yeah, it was kind of bad. The Stop the Steal thing was bad. But it's real. But the Democrat, the media, these guys that say that democracy is in threat, now they're just, they're really overstating things. I mean, Donald Trump right. will be, he'll go away, right? Um, so explain your argument and what Rich's pushback was. I mean, I, I tried to go through every piece of his argument. It was one of the longer pieces he's written in a while. So he, he made a lot of arguments and I don't want to bore your audience by going through them piece by piece, but I feel like the overarching failure of, of that he made was that he was like trying to define specific ways in which Trump could be an authoritarian danger and say, well, this probably couldn't happen because he would be stopped and this couldn't happen because the Constitution and that, that wouldn't happen because Republicans. And I think most of his arguments were just wrong on the specifics. But the overarching failure is that the man is an authoritarian, right? If you put an authoritarian in a position of executive power, you don't know what he's going to do, but it won't be good, right? He's he, he can't be trusted. It's 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 like you know we're going to bring a murderer to babysit our children, and they say, well, you know he he's not going to shoot them because we don't have any handguns, and he won't you know he won't poison them because we took all the poison out of the house. But like he'll probably think of something dangerous. You can't put him in that position, and he's just not even thinking of the overarching dangers of putting someone who obviously can't be trusted with power in power. Yeah, I th I liked the. Uh... His argument that was, um, well, I, he would have to leave in 2029. And, and even if even if he did, even if these Trump derangement syndrome people are right and he tried to stay, the institutional Washington and the military would take right. care of that. <laughs> I was like, that sounds horrible. OK, like that sounds like, <laughs> right. like you're of the view just, that there's a one percent chance that Donald Trump right. will stay in power and that the military will have to prevent yeah. him from staying in we'll power. That is a nightmare. Like it that is end of America, America shit. Yeah, yeah. It works in Latin America. We don't have any problems with that. <laughs> so it's just um, like that. I mean, I, I just don't know how you write that sentence and you're like, yeah, OK, well, it's all right. This might happen. It could happen that we might we might require the generals to prevent Donald Trump from staying in power. But but after to, that little after that little kerfuffles over, we'll just be back be, on the back be on. Fine. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that he's basically trying to put Michael Flynn type lunatics in charge of the military right. so that that doesn't happen. Like when he uses the Insurrection Act that they'll say, you know, who do we shoot and when, not maybe we shouldn't be shooting people. Yeah. Well, 
Anyway, hopefully we can win some of these people over, Jonathan. Um, it is, uh, I guess it was, I thought it was going to be dessert to dunk on Rich Lowry, but it's kind of a bittersweet dessert. It's a bittersweet chocolate, <laughs> thinking about the fact that there are people <laughs> going along with this argument. Uh, Jonathan Shade, New York Magazine, thank you for coming back to the Bulwark Podcast. I hope to do it again thank soon. You. I appreciate you very much. You too. Thanks. All right. We will see you back here on Monday uh, with Bill Crystal and uh, maybe Ben Wittes, too. Talk to you then. <laughs>